Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I have lots of disclosures, so I won't list them. Uh, I think what's really exciting is that wearable technology has become mainstream. And I know uh, we've got our WHOOP study going on here. A number of folks have been using the Apple um, Watch for a while. And I, you know, even in sports, the golf uh, motion monitor. And there's, there's just a lot going on with respect to wearable technology. And it's become mainstream. There's one study here locally. Uh, in Silicon Valley that over 70% of physicians are also using some form of tracker, um, whether it's for sleep or steps or any other thing. Um, and I think it's just interesting that this really helps uh, what we've been looking at at a real detailed level um, in my research for the past 20 years uh, with a variety of sensors. We started out mostly with force sensors, the FSR, force, force sensing resistors, um, built a number of different types of sensors with engineers um, over the years. The one that I would talk mostly about today are the motion sensors. And what's been fun is really learning from my colleagues in engineering who study haptics, the science of touch. And there's some real interesting science here in terms of what human beings do that's pretty predictable based on your perception, based on uh, in intuition, and based on search, searching behavior when you're trying to gather information. And so we've partnered with them to really gain some insight into the data that we're capturing with uh, sensors. What's been fun is to think about having haptics with metrics. When I speak with most of the haptic scientists, they've mainly studied this using video and qualitative methods. And uh, several years ago, they invited uh, all of the haptic scientists uh, that were doing things in a wide variety, K through 12, with seniors, um, people who are blind, a number of different things. And, and we were one of the only groups that had quantitative metrics. And so people were pretty excited and have been uh, collaborating with us uh, since that time. And I think if you think about what we do in surgery, there is a learning curve to mastery. And what's interesting is that it's been said for quite some time that a skillfully performed operation is about 75% decision making and 25% dexterity. So really thinking about what do haptics really give you? Well, here's the answer. There's a visual haptic loop. It's many times unconscious for us uh, in that we make a decision what step we are going to work on, what instruments we have, and then we get started. And every moment that we look at how the tissue responds to what we do, we then modify our actions. And sometimes we're not really aware of it, but once you see how that uh, tissue responds to your dissector or to a, a suture, a needle, you automatically adjust such that you get the visual outcome that you want. So there's this visual haptic loop, and we are able to capture that, which is just, I think, crazy amazing and very exciting. Um, it has really added a lot to haptic science. Uh, this is our laboratory version of the quantified surgeon. It's very much the goal uh, to translate all of this to the operating room, and I'll share a little bit of that with you today. Um, in one of our more recent study, we had four data streams uh, that were all synchronized, uh, including audio, video, EEG, and motion tracking. And it's just really interesting to see uh, how these data streams actually really increase the value of video. A lot of us are talking about using AI for video, and I'll share some of that. Uh, but these other data streams really increase the value and efficiency um, of video analysis. So what we're looking at is really a new data stream. And if you think about how we give feedback in the OR, uh, based on my years of research, I said I think that it really, many times it takes uh, 10 years to get someone from competency to mastery, mainly because we're doing it based on verbal feedback. Even getting someone who's a novice, getting them to competency, our feedback to the residents is verbal. Um, our, our exchange with each other is largely verbal. We do go around and look at what others do in the OR. We look at videos. Um, and so we do have a lot of visual 
But the interesting thing is that there's some things that human beings aren't able to track visually. So you can watch someone and we say, wow, they're really slick and they're smooth, but you have no idea what kind of forces they're using. Um, how they're pacing themselves. And so we're able to really get into those detail. And I think that, um, again, this new data stream, and I'll just share the data on the next slide, um, really, really will increase the value of search for research and how we use that uh, and integrate it for uh, feedback. So uh, this is a fellow, um, a plastic uh, surgeon doing a simulated microvascular anastomosis. And I will tell you up front what happens. Uh, there's two things. One, notice the fellow is sewing away from themselves. But the bigger mistake uh, that they make is that they pull their end suture tail out of the field of view under the microscope. And many times when we're tired, we do this. But what we, what we usually do, we'll just cut it so that you don't have to taste that suture tail around. Well, the fellow didn't cut it. And you'll start to see. I'll show you the motion pattern, how it really affected. I think what's really interesting is you you know, and it, as an attending, you may give them a fellow or a resident some feedback um, on why, you know, that's not efficient. And they can hear you, sort of. But it's a bigger difference when you look at uh, the motion pattern. So here it goes right here. Difference with uh, the... You also notice there's a little bit of tremor, probably some coffee going on here. But you can also see the working volume of the experienced surgeon is just smaller. Very much within a localized area. Started that video much later and, and motion pattern. So it pulls up that tremor, and this is, you know, because this is really small microscope, we've blown the gain up. But this is uh, plotted in terms of percent completion. And so the dark blue areas are when you're just beginning. The yellow is when you're finishing. And if you look at uh, the uh, faculty person, this is the first uh, motion towards uh, that first knot. Reaching out a little further, and as the uh, suture tail gets shorter, um, then their motion and their reach uh, is smaller. First not the second knot, the third knot, and you see a big difference. And I think, again, to, to have this type of data immediately complement what you're verbally saying to someone, they believe the data, it's, it's very clear uh, in terms of the difference in the pattern that you're seeing. And this gives people a goal, you know, to work towards when they understand what it is that a master surgeon looks like in terms of when you're quantifying what they do. But all of this, this is not someone who doesn't know how to knot tie. Right? So this is not a basic skill. This is someone who's wanting to get from competency to mastery. Um, and that's another reason why it's actually hard for some of the fellows and residents to hear us, because their outcome is pretty good, but they don't see that they're doing things that can cause an error or um, have an effect on, on efficiency. And this is a simple rule-based error, um, and just in terms of correcting uh, a suture tail thing and cutting that. So what I will do today is share some examples of how we use the motion data to um, understand technical skills as well as cognitive and um, math. And this particular uh, example that I just gave you kind of covers uh, at least the technical and, and mastery. So from a technical perspective, uh, this is just showing you the uh, magnetic motion tracking sensor close up. Uh, it's really only the first centimeter. The rest of it is wired. This is an off-the-shelf technology. Uh, this is part of the problem. We can't use this in the operating room because it's wired. Um, and we are right now developing uh, a wireless uh, magnetic motion tracking technology in our lab. Uh, this was a simulator, a ventral hernia simulator that we developed over 15 years ago. And I apologize to the MAS surgeons. We don't repair ventral hernias this way anymore. Um, but it was still a, a valid uh, simulation to track uh, movements. It's a benchtop model, and the benefit of this is that you can use all of the instruments that you normally use in the operating room, so the haptics are real. Uh, this is a close-up after the person has gotten in some anchoring sutures, pulled the contents out of the hernia, and is then attacking uh, the uh, mesh in place. Again, I know that we don't do this uh, this way anymore, but just to give you a sense of what it, what are the, when you quantify doing a surgical procedure, what it looks like. Uh, and this is one of my quantified residents um, from University of Wisconsin. 
Uh, he's wearing video glasses, audio, the motion tracking that you can see the cables coming through the white um, jacket there. And all of these inputs are synchronized, a laparoscopic view on the camera, um, his uh, video glass from, you know, visualization from uh, the surgeon perspective, and then an external camera overhead tracking uh, the hands. Those are all synchronized. And then we also combine this just to look for validity, um, any validity evidence of what we're looking at with the motion and uh, video data is the tried and true checklist, which uh, many folks have, are familiar with in terms of of what people are doing uh, correctly. And then we also have the residents do a self-assessment and FPA is a final product analysis where you're able to take the hernia skin off and look at the placement of the mesh and uh, see how flat it is and what coverage you have. And um, so these are all of the uh, data collection and assessment. One of the things we noticed was depth perception. And this was a study that we did with second and third year residents. We didn't expect them to have any level of competency in doing a laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. In fact, we actually started them with uh, part of the mesh for this particular study. It was um, a seven center study, 100 residents. We started it with the mesh, at least two of the anchoring sutures already pulled through in a proper position and all they had to do was then pull up the other anchoring sutures and get the mesh in. But in this video you'll see as residents having some issues with depth perception, um, they are trying to hand uh, themselves uh, the suture with this suture passer and uh, someone's handing it to them and they're struggling. Again, this is one of those scenarios uh, if this is happening in the operating room at some point, the attending would get a little impatient and take over and it's very frustrating for the residents because they're moving and they feel like they're getting stuff done. But when you look at the motion pattern and you show it to them, then they really sort of can see what it is that you're, you're looking at. One of the things we wanted to do was in these studies, this is a simulation, we let the residents struggle and figure it out and get through it. Um, and we uh, graded their hernia repair using uh, sort of the, one of the SAGE's um, grading scales in terms of hernia placement. And we stratified them by those who uh, got a top score or were a top performer, had a, you know, a perfect score in terms of their mesh placement. And then we um, looked at those who, that had a lower score. And this is the motion pattern for the entire procedure. And it's sort of an odd because it's a 3D uh, rendition, but you can see when they're area where their hands are mostly in the laparoscopic instruments, hands near the Mayo stand, and then hands near the hernia site. And mainly all of this area is work um, at the hernia site. And when you look at this pattern compared to the pattern of someone who didn't uh, score as well in their uh, mesh, the quality of their mesh placement wasn't that great. Um, you can see some big differences here. They spent a whole lot of time going back and forth uh, to the Mayo stand. Um, and a lot of different movements here. This one is in terms of velocity instead of percent completion like the last motion uh, uh, diagram that I showed you. One of the things, and this is what's exciting again about synchronizing motion with video is that we went and looked, just clicked on this area and looked back at the video in terms of what was going on here because this is an area that shows up that doesn't show up on the uh, top performer. And it turns out that the resident here made their abdominal wall incision too large and their port kept coming out. The port and the instrument kept coming out and so that's why they're putting things back to the mail stand, switching out. Finally, they just stopped the procedure and spent time suturing uh, the port site smaller so that it wouldn't come out but then they spent most of their time repairing the port site and they didn't get a chance to do a really good job with the hernia. Um, with this, we were pretty curious, you know, is there a correlation between the motion pattern and um, the placement uh, of a hernia. And it turns out that there is a significant correlation uh, path length and that relates to depth perception and it's also um, if you're you know, moving back and forth to the mail stand and taking instruments out that uh, increases your path length. And it turns out that the less smooth you are, um, you have a lower uh, final product score in terms of that and the longer your path length. What was interesting for us is that we thought, well, if the entire motion pattern does predict the quality of the repair um, for um, a junior resident, what about their first initial movement? And so we then looked at, you know, within the first five minutes, we uh, wrote a paper, we called this shortcut assessment, can residents' operative performance be determined in the first five minutes of an operative task or procedure? And it turns out the answer is yes. Um, and execution time with pulling up just that first uh, suture tail from one of the anchoring sutures correlates 
uh, with the final product score, um, as well as the path length of the dominant hand. Um, and then by the time you pull up the second uh, suture tail, um, almost everything and bimanual dexterity shows up in terms of how you're assisting yourself. And I have to say the bimanual dexterity thing shows up whether you're looking at junior residents um, getting a competency, looking at uh, more senior residents or fellows getting a mastery. Um, that's one of the interesting, interesting ones that uh, turns up uh, all the time, and I'll share some of that with you. But it turns out that instrument autonomy uh, does play a role um, from a technical standpoint. And what happened with a number of the residents is, you know, because we allowed them to do this completely independently, they didn't have an attending assisting, and you know, the circulating or the scrub nurse uh, handed them things, but did not really assist or say, oh, you forgot to do this or anything. And so many of them, we were able to look at some of the errors um, that they made, and it did affect their uh, cognitive load because many of them thought they were you know, pretty good at doing this. But after a while, um, you start to see uh, they're getting frustrated and you know, forgetting steps. Um, and a lot of that is cognitive load. And so getting to a point where you're facile with the instruments then leaves more cognitive um, space to address errors or difficulties um, procedure. So that's an example from the technical perspective. And now I'll look at cognitive. One of our early studies we did um, was just looking at perception. Um, what does it take and how do surgeons adjust what they do uh, in terms of putting three sutures with proline, with a lot of memory, in rubber, a balloon material, tissue paper, and foam. Obviously, we don't spend a lot of time suturing on these things, but you have a sense of these materials from your daily life. And um, we wanted to see if we can capture how people adjust what they do based on their perception of what it takes to put a suture in these materials. Um, you will note here, this is a different uh, type of motion tracker. This is an LED, a light-based one, and we stopped using these because the data collection unit is a camera that's overhead. When you supinate your hand, you lose data. And so the magnetic motion uh, tracking devices are ones that we're using now because it doesn't uh, require a line of sight um, to get that data. But I'll share with you what we found. Um, obviously, the, the attendings were more efficient. Uh, on average, we had about uh, 10 medical students, 10 residents, 10 attendings. Um, they were more efficient across all three um, of the uh, suture tasks. And everybody, regardless of level of skill, spent more time. They were more idle, um, meaning you're pausing and you're being more careful with the tissue paper, which makes perfect sense. Uh, it's one thing to see it in the data. What was even more interesting is when you compare the medical students, residents, and attending, and you take just the placement of one suture, and you break it down into every little thing that you're doing. Entering the tissue with the needle, driving the needle through the tissue, pulling the needle out of the tissue, tying a knot, tightening it, cutting the suture tail, uh, and then uh, grasping the suture with an instrument. The medical students were more idle and more careful uh, and this is with the tissue uh, paper, with um, the needle entering the tissue. They thought, you know, yeah, that, that's definitely where you, and everybody was, you know, more idle across all of the steps there, but the students were, were super, super careful, pausing and taking more time because they were worried they were going to cut the tissue paper with the needle driver. Um, but you notice the residents uh, were a little more careful um, in terms of driving the needle through the attendings are more careful when tying the knot. So this is just interesting to show that people are, you know, there is a level of um, what I was saying in terms of master surgeons, what they do and how they modify what they do along the way. And I can tell you by the time you place in your second and third suture, some of these times change, which is also pretty interesting. Um, but just to show you that you can uh, put three uh, sutures in a proline uh, tissue. We looked at some of these more closely. The first knot is all the way to your right. Um, the first suture, I should say. And the hole in the tissue is larger. It gets smaller as you go. Because once you figure out how to do this, then you're adjusting um, your micro movements. This is the visual haptic loop. Uh, and it also got more um, efficient. Uh, and uh, some of these students got the, the, the knot, you know, the suture and the knot in, but then tore um, at some point when they were tying a knot. So I think for us, which was really exciting, 
most of the people who were looking at motion tracking data in surgery, um, and it's a small group of us, usual suspects, um, most people were only looking at motion. And so idle time, when you're not moving or when you're making really, really slow movement, it turns out to be really valuable. It correlates both with skill level and task difficulty. And it really represents when you're pausing for surgical planning and you're gathering information, um, making some decisions. And also what we noted in a separate study was that we could detect skills decay in residents who went into the lab by looking at idle time um, and comparing it just before they went into the lab with certain tasks and then after two years in the lab where they were idle and you could tell that they, they had some skills decay in certain areas of procedures and the idle time metric turned out to be really valuable. So covered technical skills, covered cognitive skills just in terms of perception and decision making uh, in the operating room. I'll go over some things with judgment. What you're looking at here is a cardiothoracic surgeon who is uh, suturing an atrial appendage in a, a simulated uh, bovine um, it's a bovine heart and a, a simulated patient. They just took the patient off pump and suturing up the atrial appendage. In this study, we actually put sensors both on the surgeon as well as their assistant, and it turns out, I, don't, I can't show you everything, but it turns out you can tell the level of the surgeon by what the si assistant is doing, just looking at the motion pattern of the assistant. But back to this particular suturing of the atrial appendage. You can see that the left hand is mainly assisting, has a smaller working volume, mainly going back and forth. The right hand, where you see the dark blue um, in the bottom, I don't have a pointer, uh, that's when they're suturing, these really small movements suturing in the atrial appendage. The larger loop pattern is when they're just pulling the suture through. And so if I had this plotted in velocity, that would be uh, the green part where they're moving really quickly. The interesting thing is you see one little dip um, that, that pulling the suture through, and that's when the suture gets caught around the atrial appendage. I'll play it again, and uh, it happens really quickly, but you can see that uh, these motion tracking devices capture everything, even if it's not an error. Um, there it is. And so it really helps us to understand, you know, not only how efficient you are and how fast you are with your motions and your movement, but also error rescue. When something happens or, you know, and there's a range of errors, some of them are not consequential except for just in terms of your amount of time. Um, but we're able to, again, go right to that exact moment and look back at the video and see what happened. So I think this is one of those moments where you think about how we currently use AI to annotate videos. It's, it's human effort. It's human in the loop. Um, and then once you do your training, then they can look for things. But these are things that we wouldn't normally expect to annotate in a video. Um, so it's interesting, again, that the motion will, will definitely enable us um, to have more consistent annotations and ones that are based on data as opposed to human effort. Um, this is sort of, uh, this is a comparison of a cardiothoracic fellow and a faculty person in terms of closing the atrial appendage. And I'll talk through a few things here. One, you see with the, both of them were right-handed, you see that there is this backward C uh, sort of pattern. And uh, the part on the bottom of the screen in the X, Y axis is when they're placing sutures in the atrial appendage. What's really interesting is that the experienced surgeon actually slows down more than the fellow. Um, but then you see the fellow has all of these different moves and there are probably like not liking their, the suture and then they're redoing it and going back and forth. But the attending actually slows down. The other thing you see is that bimanual dexterity. So the motion pattern for the left hand has a much longer path length than that of the fellow. The attending uses their left hand to assist them and their right hand um, is just more smooth. One of the other things we looked at um, was operative strategy, just in terms of looking at mastery. What is it that master surgeons do? Um, and most of these were residents, and we had one a fellow uh, in urology. This was a small study. We looked at, we gave them a procedure where they had to dissect a, a tumor, a simulated tumor out of the pelvis. What they didn't know was that regardless of what they did, they were going to get into torrential bleeding um, because we rigged it such that when the tumor was pulled off that you were just going to get bleeding. What we wanted to see was what was going to be their strategy. Again, error rescue or, um, you know, rescuing and controlling bleeding. What's your reaction time? Um, I won't play the videos, but there were two strategies that were most common. Some of them paused and then asked for another instrument. Um, to be docked and, and then, but the others 
grab the vein with whatever grasper that they had at that point in time and then ask for a different tool and then got their sutures ready. Um, and, you know, that was the big difference. One of them was a fellow um, in urology, obviously doing lots of procedures in the pelvis. Idle time was five seconds, blood loss, very different than the average uh, of the residents. And so with this, it helps us to look at strategy um, and figure out what it is that people are doing um, and making quick decisions and react to, um, uh, reaction time. One other thing that we've done, a study in 2019, which was the last in-person meeting with the American College of Surgeons, um, was actually go and try to capture data from practicing clinicians. Because I think when we look at what we're doing in terms of quantifying mastery, um, our goal is really to have a database of practicing clinicians such that then we have criteria and performance for residents and fellows and other faculty who want to share um, data and understand what it is that master surgeons do and you know little things that people do differently and sometimes uh, we talk a lot about skill and the thousand hours but a lot of the things that we're seeing are really rule-based errors and so just to see that someone does it differently and then see the difference between the efficiency of that and the motion pattern of what you do compared to someone else um, and that's really been the interest um, of a lot of people and I think that it can take us to another level and shorten the learning curve um, both to competency and to mastery um, with this type of data. Um, the, the data collection was a huge success. It was the first time that the college allowed um, a university to do a research study with a 16,000 square foot booth. Um, and what we had was a loop of bow, um, and we didn't tell the people what was there um, we just said that you just did a, you know, an extensive license of adhesions for two hours and now you're running the bowel looking for enterotomies. And what we did was we wanted to force them to make a decision. We had a larger enterotomy and then a very small one nearby. And we wanted to force them to make a decision whether they would um, cut the tissue in between and do one larger repair or repair them separately. And we just wanted to see people's strategy and how they make decisions and what they do. Um, this was our uh, data collection booth. We ended up having 255 participants over the three days. Most of them were attendings. Um, when there weren't attendings at every booth, we allowed the residents. Obviously, we want to use this with the residents, but obviously, if you just have residents doing it, then you don't have the, the goal of a benchmark in terms of criteria and performance with the faculty. So many of the residents came, understood what we were doing, and then they went to go get their attendings to come back and, and participate in the study. So it was a, uh, a concerted effort um, to get this uh, uh, experience database. Uh, and they showed up and it was great. And many people were excited to participate and are committed to partnering with us in terms of future studies. And so just sort of closing out in terms of digital tracking, I think it's really exciting. Um, there's a lot of um, engineering groups that weren't in this space. They're building lots of wearable technologies, but more for patients. And now that they're seeing this data and we're presenting at their conferences, they're wanting to partner with us and understand the benefit of this type of technology. A lot of these are um, the sort of pilot technologies uh, with a number of groups that we're partnering with. That one. But uh, just as I mentioned again, both c combining a expert database um, of clinicians who are wearing wearable technologies will greatly facilitate the AI analysis. And the goal really is to, no one wants to watch a four hour video. What you want is, you know, the 10 second video clip that matters um, and where you can learn the most from what someone does compared to what you do. And that's really what we're after uh, once we're able to get this technology in the operating room. The goal is really to have this part of everyday use and really just improve information exchange. Obviously, I'm not naive that, you know, we have to do the work on the other side in terms of policy and make sure that this, that we're protected in terms of using this data. So we're also partnering with the college uh, in terms of protecting this from a legal perspective. Uh, the other reality is that a lot of the industry groups we all know intuitive has some of this data um, in terms of motion uh, data and video. And they're partnering with universities um, and we've partnered with them as well. Uh, they've not built an R&D lab um, to look at it initially, mainly their um, 
having their motion tracking help them initially when they did this was to understand any failures in their robot arm, but now they realize that this is also capturing what it is that surgeons do. So there's a huge opportunity here, but I think that the surgeons need to lead this, not industry. Otherwise, they're gonna impose what they think are good metrics and start to rank us based on what they think when you know, really this is something that should be used to shorten the learning curve to competency and mastery, and it should be our data. Um, and that's the one good thing about it. If it's a surgeon's wearable, it's your data. So there's some, there's some interesting opportunities here uh, in terms of moving forth with information exchange. I've already translated one of these uh, sensors to the operating room because it doesn't, it is wireless, so you can see the, uh, it's the EEG sensor right here. Um, and I wore the same sensor throughout the day. Um, the company changed their uh, wearable somewhat because by the end of the day, one of the sensors, at least the end, started to come off. Um, but I had it on all day through multiple procedures. Um, and it's wireless. This main uh, connection piece uh, is to a unit that's in my um, pocket of my scrubs and then the other uh, data acquisition unit is on the table. And so this is my brain when I'm walking a resident through an appendectomy. And it turns out that um, the lighter blue areas is when nothing's really happening. The dark red is e when they're um, either I'm communicating and partnering with a resident in terms of their dissection, um, and there's really important anatomy, more of it, the darker areas are when the staple's being applied across something like this is the critical part. Like there's no turning back after you, you know, do this. Um, but and there's a pattern both for an appendectomy as well as an, uh, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Again, this is an example where you just want to know when the attending was giving feedback to the resident or talking, you know, or when there was interesting anatomy. And this synchronized with video can get you that really quickly from the video data as opposed to just watching, you know, a 40 minute video. So I think there's lots of opportunities here in terms of combining. Um, wearable technology to shorten um, our video review and shorten the learning curve. And so this is what we're continuing to do. Thank you.